We are joined here at live in the KODX studios by the host of the Post Prison Education Program, Catherine Guzik. Catherine, uh, take it away. Yes. So here we have um, Marla and McKenna. Um, they are Seattle Academy students, as well as Ari Khan, who is the founder of Post Prison Education Program. That's it? You're going to stop with that? <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, I wasn't going to uh, be on the show tonight, but I wanted to stop by and uh, talk about McKenna and Marla a little bit. So we, for five years, we've uh, been fortunate enough to have uh, students, senior students from Seattle Academy uh, work with us for their senior project the spring quarter of each year. And um, it's been pretty amazing. We, uh, the first year I didn't quite know what was gonna happen and I didn't know what to expect and I was thinking about high school students coming into the office and I was thinking of high school students as high school students, not as brilliant young adults. And we really quickly found out that uh, SAS, Seattle Academy has nobody there that's not like a brilliant young adult and and so we've we've uh we've saddled the people that have come to us with just doing the same stuff that we do and uh and so uh this year uh marla and mckenna so mckenna is over there and marla's here walked into uh us having uh had the state board which oversees all the community colleges in Washington, um, ask us to determine the recidivism rate for each level of service. And so the first project we had was, was me asking them to try and extract that data. So we have four levels of service, uh, zero through three. Zero is basically somebody, a prisoner uh, applies and we do nothing. We get the we get the application in, and for whatever reasons, we don't do anything but archive it. And that's usually lack of funding. Um, it's very very seldom that it's a matter of we we think that uh, they're not deserving of help. It's almost always lack of funding. And so the, the zero level service that comes in, we archive it, do nothing. And so I would expect that the uh, that the that the recidivism rate for that group would match the Department of Corrections, which has risen to 33.5 percent, and uh, and we found out that I was wrong, uh, way off the mark. So level of service one is we get more and more engaged. That's basic services. We expect that that to go down, and then level of service two we're even more engaged, and so we expect even lower recidivism rate. In level service three, when we're fully engaged, that should be the lowest recidivism rate that we have. And and what uh, what 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 happened was when UW finished the uh, 2016 research of the project uh, of our work with 1,746 prisoners and former prisoners, and we let uh, Brian Walsh, who's now with Vera, know uh, he was at the state board at the time that that the, our recidivism rate was 7.87%, that our students were 92.13% successful, uh, that Brian instantly asked, well, like, what's the recidivism rate for each level of service? And, and we spent two years tr having trouble pulling that out of Salesforce. I mean, it's, it's, it's really difficult to pull data out of Salesforce. And, and uh, so when... when uh, Marla and McKenna came in. The first thing I did was I just basically asked them to sit down at the conference table and put all these printouts from Salesforce in front of them, and and they went to work. And I'll let them talk about what they found out and and why. Uh, and so, but we uh, we went from that to asking them to. Uh, Go through the applications that were under under active super under active consideration, uh, and 
and reduce that number because again funding is 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 impossibly tight right now and uh, and decide which ones were going to be archived and which ones we were going to continue to look at and so they read a lot of applications and the other night when they did their senior project presentation at Seattle Academy which is always pretty cool um, then then they talked about what they saw when they were reading prisoners' applications and and how that how that struck them and so hopefully they'll talk about that and then I want I always want people from the public whether you're with Google or Amazon or or a real estate agent in Gig Harbor or government or whatever I I want to have them go into the prisons and meet prisoners and 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 discover their humanity. And uh, so we we arranged a trip out to the Washington Correction Center for Women outside of Gig Harbor and uh, spent a day out there with the assistant superintendent, uh, who I've known for a very long time, Melissa Andrzejewski. And so they can maybe talk about that. Uh, but it's... Uh, uh, it's the end of the quarter, and they've graduated. They graduated at, at McCall Hall the other night, um, and they were headed off to college at the at the end of the summer. And uh, um, and I'm gonna shut up, believe it or not, <laughs> and, and let Marla and McKenna and Catherine talk and go from there. Yeah, you guys should go over the application process and how you know that process went about and you know what common themes that you found than that yeah yeah i can speak to this a little bit so um actually on my first day i don't think marla was there yet but on my first day i got to sit in on something called a scholarship committee meeting which was a really good insight for me into what the program was really about and how the program worked and so what this meeting was, was we got the opportunity to meet with a student who was applying for the services of the program. And we got to sit down with him and ask him um, pretty specific, personalized questions about what his plan was um, since he had just recently gotten out of prison and what he hoped to do when he got the resources from the program that they could provide and just really what he was about and what he wanted to get out of this experience and opportunity. And then we sat down afterwards and we went through a ranking system, which basically described um, his need and how prepared he was to come into the world after prison. And what I found interesting was that Ari said in looking through these criteria, the people that they help aren't actually the people who seem the most prepared to go into their lives and to have everything figured out. In fact, it's the people who are on the opposite side of the spectrum and who are having a much more difficult time finding themselves on their feet when they get out of prison and find that they don't have the people and resources that they need once they get out. And those are the people who are most at risk, and so those are the people who are most in need of help. And for that reason, those are the people that the program chooses to focus on and chooses to give their focus to, which I thought was a really important aspect of what the program does. But Yeah. Um, thank you for having us on the show, first of all. Yeah. <laughs> um, unfortunately, I wasn't there to see the interview, but I did read a great deal of applications um, and the personal statements and so on, um, which was a really spectacular opportunity. Um, and I think we'll speak to this later probably, but the similarities shown throughout um, each application and personal statement, although there was a lot of differences because people's like personal life stories. Um, but the similarities in their background and where they came from was um, pretty similar, more so than I could have ever imagined, um, which was something really crazy and surprising while reading the applications at the beginning. Mm -hmm. Was there any particular application that you read that just like really, I don't know, it struck you in any way, just that you can remember? Um, I wouldn't say there's one particular one. What I found myself doing a lot was a lot of them would speak to like previous crimes they committed. Um, and then they would go on to tell these like amazing stories of where they come from and how they're hopeful going on in the future. And they're looking forward to change themselves and better themselves for the people that they love. Um, and it just put a whole new ideology into my head about who these 
um, people are and where they're coming from and what their dreams and hopes are, um, which was pretty crazy to see. So sure. after looking at the applications, was there a way that you actually figured out um, who was exactly the most in need of the resources? Yeah. Um, real quick, I'll sp so when I was reading the applications, um, I found it extremely difficult to say that like none of them didn't need aid. Like while I was reading through all of them, I wanted, and I'm sure this was really hard for Ari too, because I was trying to score them. But for every single one, I said that they should receive some um, sort of aid because they all seemed very deserving of it. Um, so yeah, that was my thought. I thought it was extremely hard to pick which ones specifically like needed it the most. But. Yeah, and to add on what Marla was talking about before, I thought that one thing that was pretty eye-opening to me was the um, nearly predictable situations that we read about and the ways in which these situations played out, which again felt sem like somewhat predictable by the time that we had read so many of them. And this was something that Ari spoke to pretty early on in our time, just that a lot of these issues are situational and are based on circumstance. And when people are put in very specific circumstances with far less than ideal um, or humane circumstances, then there's really no other path and no other option. And so we keep kept seeing these patterns play out in a way that was pretty pretty frightening um, and just sure. disheartening and unfortunate because it felt like much less of a product of individuals and their actions and their, um, you know, desires and wants and much more systematic and something that was far greater than just an individual thing. For sure. All right. Um, do people reapply um, and fill out the applications regularly or just yeah, once? Yeah, no, they, and actually at the very end of Marlon McKenna's time in the spring quarter, I had them working with Shalisha and Josh to uh, segregate applications that, uh, am I far enough away from this thing, Mike? Uh, to segregate applications where people applied and we did nothing and then they recidivate. And that's become, that's become really sad and it's become really predictable. I mean, I, uh, um, I remember the first time we ever really encountered this, a guy named Peter Heyman was on the board of directors and he was in the office a lot. And I had a stack of these on my, on my desk and I sat him down, I'm like, read these. And it's like, you know, they apply, we don't have the funds to help and they go back to prison. And, the, and, the, and based on the morbidity studies that are coming out of the University of Washington from Mark Stern, uh, 2017, 2007, 2013, some don't just recidivate, they die. They die at a, at a very high rate from overdose or, or, um, or suicide. And so um, we ended up with two files uh, that are about this tall, six, six or seven inches tall out of just the ones that Marla McKenna and Shalisha and Josh were working through where people applied and we didn't, we weren't able to help and they end up going back to prison and then, and then they reapply again. And, and, and in matter of fact, you met Josh and, and he's, he's one of those. I think Josh applied three times before he got our attention. Uh, and it's, um, I mean, I remember maybe three or four years ago, I'm not going to name her, but it was, it was 2015, we were getting the files ready for the researchers. And, uh, and we were in on a Sunday, and a guy that uh, worked for us, he was a student and an applicant and a volunteer, and now he's a graduate with a master's degree in applied mathematics. He saw this application from a young woman who had a seven-year-old child um, and two applications, and he he came out of his office over to the conference table, and he was like, "I don't know how we missed this, Ari, but you've got to read this." And it, and her second application was so compelling that I called. Uh, we got a board member, a University of Washington professor, uh, and an employee, and 
rented a zip car and went out to the women's prison in Belfair to meet with her because it was, it was that it was that compelling. Uh, and you know, and I thought at the time, and I've said a lot of times since that if I had been her, and I applied to the to our nonprofit and and got nothing, I I can't. You won't let me use the word I would use because the FCC will go crazy. But it's like I would be like. Uh, I can use the initial, right? So like F them, and they would have never heard from me again, but she reapplied. Or uh, so we, and, and then that time got our attention. It, it, but it was trauma of every conceivable, I mean, sex assaults, domestic violence, uh, every kind of abuse and trauma that a human being can suffer and still be alive, she had been through all of her life. Um, and on top of that, addiction, co-occurring disorders, and mental illness. And um, so it happens all the time, Catherine. It, it, and, and I think uh, I actually I've got this stack that uh, that I don't quite know what I'm going to do with, right? But I'm uh, probably going to try to use it for fundraising. You know, it'd be it, it, that we've got. Um, 30 or 40 people mm -hmm. just out of the current batch of applicants that have that applied we weren't able to respond um, and then they went back to prison and then they apply again and they really the really um, it's not sad it's outrageous it's infuriating the thing about it is when we have the resources to meet people's legitimate and frugal needs so that they can be successful then they are successful. Nine out of ten, ten times, they're successful. So when we don't do that, um, it's just, it's, it's horrible. I don't even know what else to say, but it happens in high numbers. All right, I remember you mentioned once that uh, someone applied to the program that was classified um, one, and mm -hmm. but they ended up being, you know, classified a lot uh, more mentally ill in the end, but then you ended up figuring that out because they're put in a different category and you ended up helping them anyway. Yeah, I think, you know. Do you remember uh, that case? I do, yeah. I do. He, he works for us and, and he's a student of ours. So it's like when uh, we, uh, we, uh, when we first were, conf when we, we, when we were first confronted with just like, massive underfunding for the first time. I mean, from 2009 till 2015, we were operating at about $600,000 a year. Um, and then Doris Buffett's foundation went upside down because her health went upside down. And, um, and that was about 40% of our funding. So then we had 700 applications in the office and this was uh, this was two Seattle Academy senior project Clara Clara and uh, and Tatum, and, and we had and we're like okay we can't even fake helping these 700 people that we're supposed to be actively considering. So we decided to change our admissions criteria, uh, and it, we change it if you're not high risk to recidivate by DOC, and seriously mentally ill then we won't consider spending money on you, right, for you. So we'll help you in every other way, basic services, level service one. So this guy who applied twice, uh, this is really a horrible story that I think. Uh, I, it needs to be told. It, 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 yeah, I, it's like, I think this rises to the level of a moral imperative and I, I it's, We've encountered it five times in the last six months, and, and I'm, I'm concerned about it. And I'm talking to allies and other nonprofits and other agencies about it because it's just horribly wrong. So this guy was in a mental health program at one of the prisons in Monroe. The program's called Crossroads, and it's an incredibly good program. And um, he was S code three, so that's a, DOC designation for serious mental illness and not stable. So like S code two would be mentally ill, but stable from voice counseling and meds, you're stable, right? Uh, 
then S code 3 is mentally ill, not stable, and the higher the number, S code 4 and 5, the worse off your situation is. And this guy was S code 3, so serious mental illness and not stable. And, in, and DOC knew it. They had, him, they had him in the Crossroads program. If they didn't, they wouldn't have had him in Crossroads if they didn't know it, right? And so, uh, but they had a program at another prison, and he, uh, and they wanted him, they needed bodies in that other program, right? And so they, uh, it, it, I started to say arbitrarily changed him from S code three to S code one, but there was nothing arbitrary about it. They changed his classification to S code one, which indicates mental ill, mentally healthy, right? and state stable and not mentally ill just so they could move him to this other prison to put him in this program so this guy was a uh, this he was like a squeaky wheel right and he was he was getting ready to come out of prison for his seventh time emphasis on seventh time and uh, and he was scared i mean this is a big guy and physically capable and you wouldn't necessarily think of him as ever being scared of anything, but he was scared that he was going to come out and, and, and do what he'd always done all of his life, go back to pr catch a new case, catch new charges, and go back to prison again and leave his kids disappointed once again. And, and, uh, and so he was desperate to reverse that trend or whatever you want to call it. And... Uh, so he was blowing up our phones, and uh, and he uh, and I remember finally one, and he was at this other prison that they had transferred him to, and so we finally agreed to give him a scholarship committee interview, and and the Department of Corrections does that, they really have worked well with us, and so we can interview people in prisons either in person, go to the prison, or Skype for business, um, and so we set up an interview via Skype with this guy. And it was kind of a courtesy because the, the, the data we have indicated he was mentally healthy. So like, so when he got on, he's on the call and he's in the counselor's office from the prison. And I told him, I said, look, I'm, I'm just gonna tell you, you don't meet our admissions criteria because the, the information we have from the Department of Corrections is that you're healthy, mentally healthy. So you're high risk to recidivate but you're not suffering serious mental illness. And he immediately was like, basically, can I say hell? <laughs> he's, he's basically, how the hell can that be? I was in the Crossroads program at Monroe. I've been S code three. I'm diagnosed with this, this, and that. It's all a matter of Department of Corrections records. How can, you, how can I be S code one healthy? And then it came out over, the minute he said to me he was he had been in crossroads, then I didn't need to hear any more. I, I, I don't care what the, D, the S code rating was. I knew he had been uh, diagnosed with ser he, he had serious problems. And so we, we made a commitment to him and um, and he uh, and, and we've worked with him since last October. So but that's we've encountered that five times. And I actually was talking to an attorney uh, this morning about it and we're going to be talking to the ombuds office uh, uh, also about it and uh, we'll see what happens but it's uh, really like wrong times 10,000 to for budgetary reasons to to say somebody that's mentally ill that they're not mentally ill when you know they are just so you can move them someplace else that's less costly to get them in a program where you need butts and chairs or however you want to look at this. It's just like, it, it's, it's, it's wrong. So, and, and I think it rises to the level of a moral imperative. I really do, so. Yeah. Um, Back to post-prison education program, but how have you specifically helped Josh? Do you want to talk about that a little bit before we go back to McKenna and Marla? Well, we. You know, when Mike was still at KEXP and, and, and selling construction and Tom Morrow hadn't really wrecked one of the valuable things in this community, which was the Mind Over Matter show that was at KEXP, um, 
we had uh, Josh and his daughter on on Mind Over Matters, and it was really amazing to not so much to listen listen to Josh, but um, but to listen to his daughter Trinity, um, and um, talk about having spent all of her life watching her dad come out of prison and go back and come out of prison and go back and come out of prison and go back and and every time he would release he would you know she had these high hopes and it was always for naught you know mental illness addiction comorbidity uh, and and no support would just wreck it and um, uh, so we um, it was really important it was necessary to get Josh's daughter out of Whatcom County. That was necessary for reasons that I'm not going to discuss. Um, and it was super important to Josh to become a good parent and get his son and daughter under a roof together. So we, we, uh, and he's no longer in Whatcom County, right? No, That's he's a great he, he, thing. They're in a three-bedroom home in Shoreline, and um, together, and uh, he's in school at North Seattle. Last quarter, he had a three nine eight GPA. This guy who's been to prison six times, and we've got Trinity in school at North Seattle College, and so, uh, um, and and. And so, so the families united, and um, and they're under one roof in a really nice community, and and future envisioning, and you don't have the history that Josh has, and not have some bumps in the road, and there are bumps in the road, and uh, and that family's been strong, and they're working hard, and um, and. Uh, and I think there'll be a good outcome, right? So, uh, but it was, you know, housing, rent, bus passes, transportation. The, the first weekend he was out of prison, I paid to bring Trinity down from Bellingham and, and, and they, you know, just one day trip down and back so that they could see each other for the first time in a long time. So it's beyond resources, you know, yeah, it yeah. helps families as yeah, well. And yeah. People forget about that, yeah. but, you know, that's a big part of what happens when people recidivate or go to prison, you know. Families get torn apart. You know, the, I want to, this, like, I want to get back to, to being quiet and let Marla and <laughs> McKenna talk again, but but it's like, but you know, this is like, I, I was asked to speak at Tacoma Community College within the last week, so, and I went down there, um, um, and in the audience, I saw Jeannie Darnell, who used to be in the House of Representatives, is now in the Senate, and now she's in. She's, I think, she's chair of the committee in the Senate that basically oversees the Department of Corrections. And I had a lot of DOC data with me, and um, and and seeing her in the audience, I I I wanted to. I was sitting at a table before I spoke with uh, uh, Suzanne Cook, who's co-chair of the this family group that coordinates with DOC on to make the department aware of family issues as, as families of prisoners see the issues to be and when I and I was just sort of I was pretty angry to see Darnell there and I and I'm calling it out by name because she she is responsible with some others uh, for a piece of legislation uh, that second only to mental illness and co-occurring disorders is responsible for recidivating and it goes to Josh's issue and it's called County of Origin. So in 2006, the Pierce County, in 2007, the Pierce County delegation to the legislature worked uh, to get to incorporate into a Senate bill, 6157, this county of origin language, which mandates that prisoners be 
released to the county where their index crime happened. So you're in prison for drugs and addiction, right? And in, in the county where that charge came from, you know all the wrong people. And probably you don't know any of the right people. And you couldn't tell, you wouldn't know where the university is or the community college is. You couldn't say where where the schools are if God held a gun to your head, right? You just know where the drug dealers are and the crack houses and the trap spots are, right? So, um, but the legislature in 2007 and 6157, Senate Bill 6157 passed this rule that requires the DOC to release people to their county of origin. And Jeannie Darnell was a key player with that. People, Debbie Regala, who's retired now, was a key player. Mike Carroll, who's dead from leukemia, was a key player. But, but sitting there seeing her in the audience just was infuriating to me because this was a, a, a group of people who have family members that are locked up and they want the best for them when they release. And here they were in their midst was this woman who put into law um, horrible legislation that literally makes it really hard and really difficult for people coming out to do well because it just puts them geographically where they shouldn't be and and uh, and, and and that ha and so the first deal with Josh was was we we told the superintendent at the prison he released from will will help him but your DOC has to put in for a, an exception to county of origin which they can do and he has to be released to King County. If, if you're gonna release him back to Wacom, we won't be involved. And, and, and the superintendent, who uh, I consider to be a friend, uh, is uh, uh, pushed that through really quickly, uh, and he released here. And then, we, and then we were gonna bring his kids down here, and he's not involved in all the mess that put him and his, oh, his brother in prison so many times, and, and so like, just talking about Josh and him being in King County as opposed to Wacom just brought that back to mind. It's, it's just uh, not a good thing. So, you know, the other day at SAS, you guys did this, this incredible presentation of, um, about what you saw and learned when you were with the program. And I don't know, you don't have your PowerPoint here with you, <laughs> but... Uh, Who needs it? But if you can... Recap. I was really moved. There were some times I actually was sitting in the back of the room with tears in my eyes, um, and I was really moved by what you said. And so, if you could talk some more about um, the same things you talked about the other night, of, 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 uh, if you want to talk about the visit with at the at, or the tour at the the women's prison or, or whatever comes sure. to mind. Not, yeah, you, you guys know. should definitely talk about the women's correctional yeah. facility. That's something very interesting to the public. I bet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you to take it away. Yeah. Well, then we can jump in right there. Um, <clears throat> that actually came towards the end of our internship. We went during our last week that we were working, and as Ari mentioned, we went down to the women's correctional facility uh, by Gig Harbor. And when we got there, we were actually really surprised by the conditions. I think, speaking for both of us, yeah, neither sure. of us had any expectations other than what we've seen primarily in the media and in movies. Um, and we had kind of an image of what a prison would look like. And after hearing so many stories about what it feels like and what it actually is like to be there, um, we definitely imagined something pretty dark and grim and yeah. we were initially surprised by how much open space there was there's a lot of garden space um, but then it was when we got in the car and we had a much deeper conversation about the institution that we learned a little bit more about it that put some of what we saw into perspective I think yeah quickly going back to what McKenna said as well I was really there was a level of like respectfulness and I didn't expect to be met with like smiles or like little um, waves from the people in the prisons, um, which was super nice to see along with like the facility that had like flowers planted. Um, so it definitely wasn't what I expected. Um, but yeah, as McKenna said, I think there's a lot of things that go 
on behind the scenes that are much deeper than the surface um, that bring up some serious issues that definitely need to be fixed in the prison system. Um, and there's not one specific thing, but a whole list of things. Um, so that was pretty, pretty surprising to see as well. Yeah, and I think that's a theme that we noticed a lot throughout this is that um, there are a lot of issues on the surface of anything, but especially with something like this, and especially when there's a lot of stigma around the type of people that are affected by issues of this sort, um, it's pretty easy for people to turn their head on people who are in prison and who have been affected by mental illness and other conditions that put them in this spot. And for this reason, it's really easy to look past the kind of issues that they have to face and the type of um, sure. pretty systemic issues that are going on. And so it's easy to turn our head to them and pretend like they're not happening or just be completely ignorant of the fact that they are. But it's really important to um, take in everything that we can and really acknowledge that there are issues here and that we need to address them. Yeah. And just going off of that, I th I'd say a huge takeaway of mine from visiting the prison and from interning at the post-prison education program was um, just to be more mindful all around. I think a lot, going off of what McKenna said, I think a lot of society is almost unaware of what's going on um, and these like deep-rooted issues that are occurring uh, in these prison systems and how hard it is for released prisoners to get work and get housing um, and so on. And I just think that's something that needs to be made aware of throughout all of society because um, it's a huge problem that could be fixed with more education. So that's something that really I feel like needs, needs to be focused on. Yeah, and I personally, and I know Marla and I have both had a lot of conversations about this, um, our empathy was increased dramatically immediately for as sure. soon as we started for working sure. at the program. And I think the biggest thing for us was meeting people who have been in prison, which I personally had never done before, and meeting some of the most friendly, kind, humble, um, open people that I've ever met. And I wouldn't have had any idea that they were in prison. And then to hear their stories and once again, hear about the systems that they fell within that really sure. led them on a path that they couldn't necessarily veer off of. And just hearing about the things that fell so outside of their control um, and the ways that they tried to deal with that and then seeing the types of steps that they had to take in order to get where they were and to find success and just how many hurdles they had to go through that could have been avoided had some light been shined on their situation, I think. For sure. And I think one thing I'll say is I said in the presentation, and I'll say it again, is that the people being released from prison are, they're real people with families and real lives and hopes and um, dreams and so forth. And because of the way um, our, society may has our society has stigmatized released prisoners, um, these people are almost unable to go out and fulfill those lives they want to, um, which is something that needs to be changed 100%. Yeah, I think it's easy for people to assume that only bad people do bad things or what for we sure. consider to be for bad sure. things, but it seems that almost the opposite is true and desperate people do things that we see as bad and people with no other options um, because I, I mean there's humanity in everyone because we are all humans and that's how we need to treat each other and that's the only way that we could really make any progress and I, I think that the research backs that up and I think that all the stories that we've heard and learned backs that up and the most important thing is just to learn about people because as soon as we started learning about the people who are really affected by this we automatically became believers in all that this program was and all for that sure. it stood for. And so um, another thing that we found a lot of value in was just hearing these stories and sharing these stories, um, which is one of the reasons we wanted to come on here and talk about some of what our experience was and the things that we were able to learn. Yeah. So I know you guys didn't go to uh, a male facility, but do you believe that this same kinds of themes would be present in both prisons, or would you think that there's some, you know, differing um, themes in the women's prison versus the men's prison? I mean, I think that, so I'll be speaking primarily to what I've heard stories from, from being here, and the main difference that it sounds as though people have observed from male facilities and women's facilities is that at these men's facilities, there's much more of a 
anger and the kind of angst that's found in any facility like that is channeled into this um, want to change it and just this anger towards the system. Whereas in women's prisons, it usually manifests as much more of a um, exhaustion and just a sense of having been completely beat down and broken nearly is a word that I think Ari used a few times, um, which is completely heartbreaking to me. But it's interesting to see that these just extreme feelings translate really different in these situations. And I'd be really curious to see what that actually means for the environment of a men's prison and what being an inmate there would actually be like compared to a women's prison. And if it then makes it harder to build communities or whatever else you would really require to be in a situation like that. Yeah, I think I completely agree with, McKen what, with what McKenna said. Um, Honestly, again, I've heard stories, I've seen movies, but I, other than that, I have no idea what um, it looks like, what it feels like to be inside a men's prison. Um, and I definitely think that opportunity would um, give me a lot of perspective to contrast the two, the women's and the male, but I definitely think McKenna has a great point in saying that in the women's prisons, it's almost as though everyone's just been beaten down repeatedly. Um, and in the men's prisons, I can imagine it's a very completely different vibe or not. But, yeah. Are there any sorts of experiences that you'd want to um, go through in relation to Ari's program? Like see anything different other than like a men's facility? Yeah, I suppose I'd just say um, learning more about people and different experiences. One subcategory of people that we talked a little bit about but didn't encounter much was sex offenders and I definitely have um, a different mindset towards that group of people based on who I am and my experiences, but hearing Ari speak about them and just speak about, again, the ways that we can build empathy and understand the circumstances that drive someone into a situation. And so I think just, yeah, a greater variety of people and experiences and stories. And then maybe um, outside of this program, but just understanding what something like this looks like outside of the state. Because a lot of it seems very individualized to hear and the issues that we have within Washington and within the prisons here, but to see if those um, really carry out nationwide or if they are pretty individual to Washington. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree with all that McKenna said. Um, I think a big thing, and I know we just touched on this, but I would just want to hear more stories because um, I think that's where I got my most understanding of how this whole thing worked. Um, I do think, going back to this, that again and again we found that the people who were um, put in bad situations, it wasn't that they were bad people at all, but just um, the path that they were on and what they were experiencing um, led them to do these things. And just the more that... I hear these people's stories and the more that I'm able to like talk to these people, the more I'm able to see and better understand where they're coming from and just gain a whole new perspective on the system. And I think that is extremely valuable for anyone, not just people um, working in this area or field, but all of society should hear these stories that these people have to tell. Yeah, and this is a bit of a tangent, but just on the value of stories, Marla and I talked about that a lot, and when we first practiced the presentation that Ari's talking about, we delivered it to someone who's um, like the head of the speech department at our school and works a lot with the way that we present things and the way that we tell stories and share ideas. And after we gave our presentation and talked so much about how much we learned from just hearing about people talk about themselves and talk about their friends' experiences, and that this was where really where our perception of what the criminal justice system looked like changed, which is a pretty profound change in the way that we think about something. But he talked about how usually we look for pretty grand statistics and evidence to point to what we should do and how we should deal with these systems, especially one as big and overarching as the criminal justice system, but that that's not actually where we found our information and that's not what we found to be the most important because it's much more valuable to find the people who are touched by these systems and understand how they actually play out and not what the numbers look like because that's really what matters and um, the kind of stories that we need to spread in order to create change and um, really make sure that 
people are doing what they need to do. Yeah, for sure. You know, uh, I'm looking at this research folder that Marlon McKenna worked with, and what McKenna just uh, said reminded me of of how little it takes to change somebody's life. And so going back to that level of service zero category that they pulled the data out on, again, I was expecting the DOC's recidivism rate of 33.5% to be about what the recidivism rate would be for the group where we got an application and did nothing. And it was half that. It was like, I think it was, you could dig it out, but I think it was like 17% or maybe even it was, but Thank you, it, was, it was half. Yeah, 18%. 18%. Mm -hmm. So, and so that immediately begged the question. And so I, I asked Marla and McKenna why they thought that was, because I wasn't quite sure. And they gave me the answer that I later got that day from a PhD microeconomist who volunteers with us from Amazon, uh, an angel. Uh, I don't think she'll mind me putting her name out as Mo Mallory Montgomery. She's just an amazing, wonderful person and super helpful. And 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 the deal was, Mallory told me she said you could have you should have expected that you should have expected the recidivism rate to be half the DOCs because you showed them an opportunity that they didn't know existed. And so, so just, so we do these quarterly presentations um, in the prisons where we might go into, dep depending on how old the prison is, how big the prison is, what how si the size of the visit room, we do these presentations. It might be 60 women at Purdy. Uh, it might be 300 men at the prison out at Aberdeen or 120 men at the prison at Connell. Um, but we do these presentations um, and spend three hours letting prisoners know about the possibilities th through the program. And if we don't do anything more than that, that's enough to change their thinking. That's it because it, you're, I, I, we had like four or five people in the office at the same time that Marla McKenna gave me this number, uh, which came out of our, again, out of our, our, our sales force, um, and that have been back to prison six, eight, ten times, that have spent most, most of their adult life locked up. And I asked them, like, why do you think this is? And everybody had the same answer. It was because you're showing people opportunities that they just literally don't know exist. And you know, I'm like a, a white guy from Central Florida, Republican bastion of haters is the way I look at it now. But anyway, from a fairly wealthy family um, raised in the 40s and 50s and and so I know about colleges and universities and, and, and opportunities and, and law schools. But there, there's so many people that have come up, you know, and, and with families that have no resources, no education, uh, children saddled with mental illness and addiction and, and just, just this, this unimaginably bad situations. And they just... They are in town with a community college and they don't even know the community college is there. They're in town with a university and maybe they know that there's a University of Washington in the U district, but they don't even quite really know what that is. And they certainly think that that doesn't offer any opportunity for them, right? And they, and, and, you know, they believe that there's, this is a movie about uh, our work that won an Emmy, which I always am a, a I'm amazed at it was done by the city of Seattle and uh, there's a woman in that she sort of became the star of that documentary her name's Gina McConnell Ott and, and somewhere in there she talks about uh, that she just at a point she believed she would you better I think Mike she believed that that uh, she would die a statistic and that's what so many people believe so like but just so just going in and into the prisons, 
uh, which to DOC's uh, credit times 10,000, going back to when I started this program uh, and was working with Eldon Vale when he was Deputy Secretary of the, of the Prisons Division, and right up through now with Steve Sinclair as Secretary, uh, you know, they, they, them facilitating us going into the prisons and making people aware of this opportunity, just that changes the way people think and, and their outlook on life to the point that they behave different, they think different, they plan different, and the recidivism rate c drops in half. Just encountering a, a three-hour meeting with us where we're letting people know about opportunity. So it takes, it's, it, it can take very little and, and to turn somebody's life around. And uh, for whatever that's worth, that's just, that's a reality now proven out by data. Uh, I want to, um, we've talked more than a few times uh, we've had this town hall Seattle event scheduled we're bringing Pete Early in from Washington DC uh, to talk about his books and his 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 family's experience through his son's death um, with the criminal justice system and how mental health issues play out with that we had this insane thing happened with Facebook over the last couple of months, which uh, I think McKenna's dad, Josh, is going to help us publicize, but but uh, he's fairly excited about it, or angry, or whatever, <laughs> if you heard anything about it, but it's like... Yes, I have. <laughs> you know, so, uh, but it was like, we Facebook wouldn't let us promote the event because they... Uh, they decided it was political, right? I mean, in writing, they said this is political, and uh, so you can't promote the event. So finally, s last Sunday, um, we got cleared, but we were 17 days away from June 20th when we were going to be at town hall, and I didn't want a half of an auditorium. I want 800 people at town hall, not 300. And so we decided to put it off till October 9th. So just uh, we'll have it out on our Facebook page. We'll have an announcement out on on um, on uh, to our listserv, and uh, but we'll be bringing Pete early in. And if you don't know his story, Google him. He was with the Washington Post reporter uh, as a reporter for years, and and then when his son. Uh, died and again it was criminal justice and mental illness don't mix well uh, then he left the Washington Post and he's now written I think 17 books he's a Pulitzer Prize nominee uh, and and has a book that uh, entitled crazy which really is the story of his son's life and and so we're bringing Pete in it'll be Thursday October 9th at Town Hall Seattle and so that's rescheduled. Um, the uh, I I don't want to spend the next the rest of our seven minutes talking about the Facebook thing, but I think it's it, what's what what happened was was if you're going to run something that Facebook people believe is uh, dealing with a national issue, uh, an issue of national importance, or it's political. They're going to make you prove that you're not a Russian or you're not with Cambridge Analytics uh, or, 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 or anything of the ilk that swayed the 2016 election and got Donald Trump elected. And, they, and so literally, uh, you know, I, I wrote to them at some point when they declined the ad, which was March 10th, and I said, um, I'm like, what, what, what's wrong with you people? This is, this is like... This is about mental illness. It's it's not about elections. It's not what's it's not political, um, and and they took forever to respond, and then all of a sudden they sent a link to me, and um, and it was like you go through these steps, and then if you if if we can prove you're basically not a Russian trying in the employee of Putin trying to you know <laughs> trying to to uh, sway 
uh, in ele- the upcoming elections or something, then we'll let you, you you'll be pre-qualified to run all these kinds of promotions on. And so clicked on the link and it was actually it's reassuring what they're doing. I, uh, in some respects, what they're doing is ridiculous. For example, allowing uh, these sto- distorted f- videos of Pelosi, right? Uh, that's okay for some reason, but us running a promotion about a town hall event about mental illness, that's not okay. Uh, uh, but but what they ran me through and would run anybody through is, is interesting. I mean, so they, 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 I think they tie into your credit bureau. So like that, I had that, like one question was like, when you lived on Pinecroft Road in Asheville, North Carolina, what was the street number? That's 40 years ago. I'm like 700 years old and I can't really, really remember 1982. On, but it's multiple choice and there was 105 and thank God I remembered that. So there was a whole series of questions like that. And then the last thing was, okay, you cleared all these hurdles. We're sending a letter to your house. Uh, and when you get it, there'll be a six digit code. And I got it yesterday. There'll be a six and I have it with me. There's a six, I'm gonna scan it to your dad. So it's like, there's a six digit code and, and you log in to facebook.com slash ID, put in the six digit code and then you'll be cool. So last night about six, I got home and the letter was there and I hurried to log in and I did it. So anyway, we're now able to promote, but they wasted 82 days um, disallowing us promoting the town hall event. So we had had no choice but to put it off. It's, uh, anyway, the, I don't know how to spend the, na- the last four minutes. Anybody got No, any Marlon ideas? McKenna, do you have any final thoughts on the program or any of your experiences? Um, well, I just want to say thank you to Ari, to Shalisha, to Josh. I firmly believe that if anyone were to sit down with any of them and just hear the stories um, of the people that they've helped and so on, it would change your whole perspective on the prison system and the people that are in prison and released from prison. Um, yeah, I think it is extremely valuable, and I could not be more grateful for the opportunity. Yeah, um, I guess I'll just second that. I gained so much and learned so much about the system and about just how to work in an office and things that all apply elsewhere, and so I'm thankful for that. But I think most importantly, as we've both spoke to extensively, it's just so important to understand everything that you can about the criminal justice system and especially locally and do the research that you can because it does affect you and likely does affect someone who is close to you. And once again, everyone is a person and deserves to be treated like that. And it's of the utmost importance to research programs like this and to do all you can to donate if you can. So yeah, I second that completely. (laughs) Be mindful. It's yes. really important. I would just, you know, what one thing, I, I remember the first Seattle Academy intern that came into the office, and um, and I was, I probably was like, and you know, somebody said it the other night, we went to the, the Catherine and I went to the, there was an advertising presentation on, on the, the earlier one, at, right before you guys, mm-hmm. and one of the advertising agency guys that had had interns was talking about, like, Oh my God! I'm gonna have these high school kids in my office. What the heck am I gonna do? And, and are they gonna be underfoot? And and what we've learned um, from the get-go is it's like don't discount youth. Do not discount youth, um, and maybe especially youth from Seattle Academy because they're amazing. Thank you. Tell people how they can contact and find out more yeah so you can find out more um about cl hall um and the event that's going to be occurring in october um through uh post prison education programs website or twitter instagram um and facebook handles and what is that website oh it's just post prison education program.com no, uh, postprisonedu. I mean, edu.org. Uh, org. Postprisonedu. <laughs> just Google us. I thought that was just your email. That was. <laughs> <laughs>
All right. So uh, thank you all for coming in.